Now that we have the skills to be able to solve a rational equation, we're going to begin to examine the relationships between those numbers. That's the heart of mathematics. Speed, distance, time, profit, working together. These are all examples of problems that can be set up and solved using these skills. One type of problem you'll encounter is a speed distance time problem. You can use this triangle to help recall the relationship between those three variables. You can also use the units to help you. So for example, speed or velocity is distance divided by time. Think kilometers per hour. Time is the distance divided by the velocity, so think how far are we going, and then if this is in, let's say, kilometers per hour, those kilometers cancel, leaving us with hours. If we're looking for distance, we know distance is speed times time, so we can use that triangle to help define the relationship. So for example, if we're going to set up an expression for the time it takes, we know that time is distance over speed. So I've got that set up here. Our distance is 15 kilometers. Our speed is decreased by 5 kilometers per hour. Now we don't know what the speed is, so that's what we're going to represent with a variable. So whatever speed we were originally traveling at, we're now going 5 kilometers per hour slower. If we are trying to find the speed of a car that traveled 50 kilometers in twice the time, it doesn't tell us what the time is, but we know that speed is distance divided by time. So we've got distance divided by whatever that time is. It's now taking us twice as long to travel. When you read the question, you first want to identify what is it that we're looking for. So we can see here that we're trying to figure out how long did the trip take? How long is time? So that tells us that we're looking for time. Time, therefore, that variable t has to be in the equation that we set up. And then we're going to go off to the side of our paper and set up a chart to help us organize the information that they give us. So in this particular question, we're traveling at an original speed and then we're changing that speed to get our new speed. Now the distance of the trip is not changing. Whether I go faster or slower, that distance is still going to be 300 kilometers to Calgary. And I'm going to pay attention to the units. So that distance is in kilometers. The speed given to us is also in kilometers per hour. That means time has to be in hours. So speed is distance over time, so we want that kilometers per hour. So you want to watch your units here. Okay, so now Sarah is reducing her time by half an hour if she drives 20 kilometers faster. We don't know the original time it takes her, but it's now going to take her half an hour less time. So whatever the original time is, she's reducing that by half an hour. We also don't know what the original speed is that she's traveling at, but we know she's going 20 kilometers an hour faster. So the original speed we can represent with a variable, and we're now increasing that original speed by 20 to get to the new speed. Once that chart is filled in, we're going to remember that we're looking for time, so ultimately I need that variable t in each of my equations. So I know that if I'm going to keep t in there, I'm going to set it up around speed. I don't have a variable variable for distance. Speed is distance over time. So in my original information, our speed is the distance divided by the time. And then once I change that, my new information, speed is the distance divided by the time. I can solve this as a system, so we want to keep t in the equation, which means I want to replace v with what v is equal to. So I can see here v is this piece. So I'm going to substitute that in for v, and that produces my rational equation, where we now have t as a variable that we can solve for. So now we're back to just going through and solving this. We're going to begin by bracketing any binomials, checking to see if they can factor. In this case, they can't. We're going to state our non-permissible value and then get our lowest common denominator. I have one binomial, so that needs to be part of my lowest common denominator, and then I've got a t as a monomial that also has to be part of my lowest common denominator. So then I'm going to look to see what did I multiply the original by to get the new lowest common denominator. I'm going to multiply the numerator by the same amount to keep it equivalent, and then because this is an equation, once my denominators are balanced, we can drop them, and at the same time I'm going to distribute in that value in front of each bracket in order to begin simplifying 
simplify. So I can see that I'm going to have a quadratic equation. I'm going to combine my like terms together. So I have a 300t. If I subtract that to bring it to zero, I'm also going to subtract 300t there. Those are both going to end up zeroing out. Because my squared term is positive, I'm just going to line up the terms in order and set this equal to zero. And now we're back to solving a quadratic equation. It's easiest if we can factor it. We can't always, but let's check. So I'm going to remove a greatest common factor, and then I end up with a trinomial. So I'm going to multiply the values of a and c together. So in this case, we have 2 times negative 15 is negative 30, and our b value is negative 1. So we're going to say, are there two numbers that multiply to negative 30 and add to negative 1? And in this case, we can see that it's going to be negative 6 and positive 5. So we can factor this. So I just set up my binomials and said what times what, our first terms multiplied together gets us back to 2t squared, and then we would say 2t times what number gives us one of those factors, so we can see 2 times no whole number will give us 5, so I need a 2 times negative 3 to get that negative 6, and then our inside product, 1 times what is going to give us our other number of 5, so that needs to be a 5, set each factor equal to 0, and then we're going to get the value of t. Now we need to check it against the restrictions. So these are the two numbers t cannot equal, those two are good. And now also consider the context. This is time. We cannot have negative time. So in this case, we're going to say that is not a possible solution to our problem, which leaves us with one solution of t equals 3. That number you're now going to substitute back in and you're going to check, does the left side of the equation equal the right side? And I will tell you it does. Now, really important, go back to the original question and look to see what are we ultimately looking looking for. We are looking for the time when she's driving at the slower speed. So you can see if we compare the speeds here, this speed, she's going 20 kilometers faster. So whatever V happens to be, this is the slower speed. So now check, time is just T, so it is going to be three hours. If, however, the question wanted to know how long does it take at the faster speed, well now this is the faster speed, so whatever time is, you'd have to now subtract 0 0.5. So 3 minus 0 0.5, it's going to take her two and a half hours at the faster speed. Now, if the question wants to know the speed at which she's traveling, you could substitute time back in three and calculate the speed for either equation. You could also originally set the equations up so we have time equals, thereby getting the variable v, velocity, into that equation. Profit is another relationship that occurs. Now, we can find the profit by figuring out what are we selling our items for minus how much did it cost us to buy all of the supplies. So for example, if I sell a batch of cookies for $20, but it cost me $10 to purchase all of the items to make them, I have brought in a profit of $10. Normally it's going to want to know, or it's going to give us information where it's the profit per item. So we're going to figure out how much does it cost to sell one item minus how much did it cost to purchase the supplies to make that one item. The cost or the price of that one item is what we typically refer to as the unit cost. And we can also see that the cost it takes to make or produce one item multiplied by the number of items we have is going to be the total price or total cost, depending on what we're looking for. Likewise, if I know the total cost of something, let's say it's $5,000, and that is for 500 items, I can then divide those numbers to get what the cost per item is. So similar to speed, distance, time, we can use a triangle to show those relationships. So if my total cost is $4,000, I can divide that by the number of items I have, and that's going to give me the price or the cost per item. So in this case, this represents the number of items we have. We're increasing that number of items by five, Five, so I've got my total cost, $4,000, divided by n plus 5 is going to give me the unit cost. I'm going to begin by setting up a chart to organize the information. So using this relationship between those three items, I've set up my categories along the top. And in this particular question, we're comparing high performance tires to regular tires. And because it also gives me a total, I'm going to add another row in here. So in this particular question, I can fill in the total price for each of those tires. And then I also know that each of the regular tires is going to be $3 less than a high performance tire. Now I don't know what the price of the high performance tire is, so I've used a variable P to represent the price of one tire. And then whatever that price is,
is our regular tire is going to be $3 less. I also know the total number of tires I have, and I'm ultimately looking for the cost of each high performance tire. So if I go down here, I can see that cost is the variable P. So we're looking to have P into our equation, and because they give us the total, we know that we can add up those two in order to get to 330. So if I'm going to set up a rational expression around this, I know N is the total cost divided by the price per item. So I can take my high performance tires and say, okay, so let's go 12. 1200 divided by the price per item, that's going to give us the number of items. For our regular tires, we can say 3,000, divide that by the price per item, and that's going to give us the total number of items. So now I can add these two together in order to get my total number of tires. I've got the variable in the equation that I'm ultimately looking for, and then I can solve. The important piece to note is that every time you're going to have to kind of manipulate depending on what those relationships are. So in this case, I can see that the high performance tires plus the regular tires equals the total number of tires. This represents the number of high performance tires. I'm going to begin by bracketing my binomials. This is the only one and it's not factorable. So I've stated my non-permissible values. I'm now going to find my lowest common denominator and then solve that equation for P. Once we have the equation set up, we go ahead and solve it. And then at this point, I can see that it's a quadratic equation. However, I don't really want to try factoring that. So even though it likely will factor, I'm still going to use the quadratic formula. You could always take out your greatest common factor first. So the numbers aren't quite so large. And then this radicand happens to be a perfect square. So then we can get the value of that. We're going to add those numbers together and divide by 660. And then we're going to subtract those numbers and divide by 60. And we get two solutions. As always, we're going to check those solutions against the restrictions, and then we're also going to substitute them back in to make sure that the left side is equal to the right side on the equation. Then the final thing is we need to look at the context. We are ultimately looking for the cost of each high performance tire. We can see that the cost of each is a variable P. So high performance, we are looking for P. So that is just these values. However, the regular cost is $3 less. So therefore we can't have a cost of 73 cents because $3 less would be a negative cost. So in this context, in this context that answer is not reasonable which means that each high performance tire is going to be $15 each regular tire is going to be 15 minus 3, 12 dollars. I just quickly want to look at how you can set up another type of profit question that you will frequently encounter. So again, look at what we're comparing. In this particular case, we can see that we're ordering bicycles. She pays this much to order her whole lot of them, and she sells her whole lot of bicycles for that much money. So in this particular case, I'm comparing the amount bought versus the amount sold. And again, go back to the relationship between those variables. So I know the total price, the number of items, and the cost per item all relate. The easiest one to fill in is what is the total price she's paying to both buy and sell them. And then we don't know how many she buys, but she gives three bicycles to her children. So that means however many she happens to buy, she's going to be selling three less. Now in this particular case, it tells me she makes a profit of $300 per bicycle. So I know that profit is equal to the selling price minus the buying price because because they give me the profit per bike, I have to determine what is the selling price per bike and what is the buying price per bike. That is what we refer to as the unit cost or the unit price. So I can set that up by saying, okay, I can find the price per bike by taking the total price and dividing by the number of bikes bought. Taking the total price that we sold for, dividing by the number of bikes sold. That gives me a rational expression that we can now substitute into our equation and solve for n. And then just watch when you get your solution, n represents the number of bikes bought. That is what this question happens to be looking for. How many did she buy or order? If the question said how many did she sell, you would have to take that value of n and subtract 3 from it. We do make a lot of assumptions when setting up problems. It's called mathematical modeling, but it does give us an idea as to what we're looking at. The last type of problem we're going to encounter is working together problems. So two or more people painting a fence together or completing some type of a job, two hoses filling up a pool. The assumption that we're going to make is that they continue to work at the same rate throughout the duration of the job. For example, let's say it takes two people five hours to complete a job working together. In one hour, they will complete one-fifth of the job. 
Let's say it takes one person three hours to complete a job. In one hour, they will complete one third of the job. Or we can even use minutes. Let's say it takes 15 minutes to complete the job. They will complete one fifteenth of the job in one unit of time. So when we have a working together problem, it's going to be the fraction of time it takes the one person plus the fraction of time it takes the other person to complete the job is going to give us the time or fraction of time it takes us to complete the job together. So for example, if we're looking at what is the fraction of a job completed by Shannon in one minute if it takes her five minutes longer than Brad. We don't know how long it takes Brad to complete the job. So my variable is the amount of time it takes Brad to complete the job and Shannon will take five minutes longer. So in one minute, Shannon is going to complete one, whatever that is, of the job. So as soon as I see a working together problem, I'm going to start with this. And the easiest thing to begin with is to look at how long does it take to complete the total job working together. So I can see that two hoses together are going to fill up the pool in two hours. So that means in one one hour, they are going to get half of the pool filled. I'm looking for if only hose A is used, the pool is going to fill in three hours. How long will it take if only hose B were used? Okay, so hose A. So if it takes hose A three hours to fill the pool, in one hour, hose A will fill one third of the pool. I'm looking to see how long is it going to take B. So now I've got my equation. I can look for my non-permissible values and then we can solve this. We get the lowest common denominator, state the non-permissible values or the restrictions, and then again, once the denominator is balanced, we can solve the numerator. And this is a linear equation. I have a degree one. So the good news, our goal is to isolate the variable, which we can easily do, and b is six. Check it against the restriction. Substitute back in to make sure the left side is equal to the right side. See if it fits the context. And in this case, it does. So it will take six hours to fill the pool if only hose b is used.